And then he pulls it, he like pulls it out of the microwave and he goes like, mm, mm, only 35 calories. calories. <laughs> All right, hit me, producer pots. Sugar, salt, and dairy. These are the three things that make everything super tasty. But if we are always adding these to our quote unquote healthy foods, can we really say we eat healthy? Oh, yes. Yes, we can. The bigger part of this question is, is it okay to add something to your salad uh, or to your vegetables or to your fish, right? Add, add to something that you don't normally like that is a really important food nutritionally. If you add flavoring ingredients to that food, does it negate the benefit of that food? And the answer broadly is no. You still get the nutrients from that food. You're still going to get the benefits of your that food. There are some caveats, however, which is when the proportion of our diets from those flavoring ingredients starts to overwhelm the proportion of our diets from the like base, really like nutrient dense, health promoting ingredients, right? So if we're adding so much flavoring ingredients to our salad, that it's mostly grated cheese and bacon and salad dressing and very, very little, you know, lettuce and vegetables, right? Like it is about understanding the relative proportion of our diets. And so with salt and sugar and uh, fats in general, um, but especially saturated fats, there is a like happy medium amount to consume above which we start to see increased risk of actually with all of them, cardiovascular disease is the biggest risk. Oh, wow. So, okay. Well, can you break those down for us? So yeah, absolutely. Our targets? Okay. So with salt, we want to stay between like 2.4 grams of sodium per day. So that's about a, just shy of a teaspoon of salt uh, or half, just shy of a half a teaspoon of salt, I should say. So between 2.4 grams and... 4.5 grams. So about a teaspoon of salt total throughout the day is kind of right in that in that range. Um, and that is not for somebody who has been put on a low sodium diet from their doctor. They would be consuming under 2.4 grams of sodium per day. Uh, for sugar, we want to stay, um, that's more measured as like total percent of calories. So for added sugars, that is honey, uh, maple syrup, sugar added to your coffee, um, the added sugar in packaged products that you might buy. We want our calories from added sugars to be no more than 10% of our total calories. So if you eat a 2000 calorie per day diet, that means sticking to 200 calories or less from added sugars. That's still 50 grams of sugar, um, which is that's still like a that's a lot of sugar. <laughs> that's like a quarter cup of sugar, I think. Yeah, it's still quite a lot of sugar throughout the day. And then we want to stick to 25% or less of our total calories from all sugars. So all sugars would include also like the sugars inherent to fruit, for example. So oh, okay. that is quite a lot of room for sugar. And then saturated fat, we want to stay below 10% of total calories. So um that's fairly easy to do if you eat a you know, vegetable forward diet. So the default mode on Nutrivore is like plant forward omnivore. So eating lots of fruits and vegetables and legumes and a handful of, you know, nuts and seeds per day, but then also eating, you know, meat and making sure to get lots of seafood. Um, so that would sort of be the starting point. You can obviously modify that to apply Nutrivore principles to your preferred diet or anti-diet, but that's kind of like the you know, if, we, if we're just looking at nutritional sciences and we're trying to craft a diet that makes it the easiest to meet our nutritional needs from the foods we eat, that is that is where we land. So lots of plant foods, but still an omnivore. Um, so that staying below 10% of calories from saturated fat is really easy with that structure. So is staying below a teaspoon of salt per day. And so is staying below 10% of added sugars. If about 80% of our calories are coming from whole foods, that's that's really straightforward. So the answer is absolutely. Um, there's actually some really interesting studies where they have, there's this one that was done in a series of like college cafeterias. Uh, this was done a couple of years ago where they labeled vegetable dishes, either giving like a really like neutral like name, like 
green beans or a like health focused name like you know healthy green beans or <laughs> a like flavor focused name like i think it was like uh Szechuan green beans with roasted garlic you know like like something describing the flavor of the dish okay and um people served themselves so college cafeteria diners would be mostly students but there would be all of the other like you'd find college staff um, and faculty in a college cafeteria as well so they measured how much people served themselves um and so people served themselves more compared to the neutral term uh, the neutral like just green beans the neutral name if people if they were given the like healthy name <laughs> healthy green beans they served themselves less green beans than the neutral just green beans name and then the you know Sichuan green beans with roasted garlic they served themselves more than the neutral term and like the difference between that was like you know 20 some odd percent like it was it was quite a large 28 percent something like that difference uh between the people who like got the this green bean sounds delicious versus this green bean sounds healthy healthy <laughs> but then what they also found was that when the green beans were like prepared in these really tasty ways people also ate more of them so basically the amount that was they were measuring how much was being thrown out uh like like the person didn't eat them so it was left on the plate and the amount being thrown out was not different so that means that the people who serve themselves more of the Sichuan green beans with roasted garlic also eat more. And I don't, I don't think it's, I don't think it's surprising to think that when you um, enjoy the flavor of a food, it's you're going to eat more of that food. Eat more of it, and right? We can apply that to ultra processed foods that are sort of addictively delicious, but we can also apply that to making uh, our salad yummy or adding. Uh, you know, Szechuan seasoning and roasted garlic to our green beans. Like that is something. Or cream and sugar to our coffee. Right. Does that apply to? Well, certainly. Yeah. I mean, coffee is healthy up to about, you know, or health promoting up to about three cups per day. And if that's the way you like your coffee, provided the sugar isn't, you know, totaling more than 10% of your calories throughout the day. Like, yep, that would, that's absolutely. But you said fine. that's 50 grams of sugar. So yeah. like. That's a lot of sugar. So someone could have their daily fancy Starbucks yeah. drink and still say, I'm a healthy person. If that's your priority, right? If that's so like for me, um, I my favorite way to have sugar would be like dessert after dinner uh, gotcha. or maybe, um, you know, a nice like chocolate truffle or something throughout like after lunch or in the afternoon. And so I kind of like save my 10% of sugar for dessert because that's what gives me the most joy. Um, I also prefer my coffee unsweetened, so that makes it easy for me. So just think about like the composition of the whole diet when you're looking at how much of these like flavoring sugar, salt, <laughs> uh, dairy, or just fat in general, like how much of these right. things am I adding to my food to make it taste good? And how does that shift the composition of my whole diet? Does that mean that most of my calories are coming from that sugar and that fat that I'm adding to my food? Or still is most of my calories coming from the food itself? So understanding that the relative proportion of how those different foods and flavoring ingredients are contributing to their whole diet is really what this question is about. It's not, uh, if it's not that it's good or bad to add flavoring to our food, if it helps you eat healthy food, you're still benefiting from that healthy food, but to a point, right? Like to a, there's, there's an amount of flavoring ingredients we can add to a food where the diet is then dominated by the flavoring ingredient and not dominated by the whole food anymore. And once we start crossing into that threshold, then the composition of the whole diet is no longer a nutrient dense health promoting diet because the whole diet is just flavoring ingredients and not the the foods underneath. There's this old Simpsons episode where I think Homer goes on a diet. We don't need to talk about that part because it's problematic <laughs> in so many different ways. Um, but he he's eating rice cakes and Marge says like, you know, it's oh, only 35 calories. calories a piece. And He's like, hello, hello, taste, taste, hello. Let's <laughs> fair. Let's, let's, let's fair. Um, 
And then uh, she says, oh, you can put a little something on it for flavor. And he loads it up with just whatever cartoon (laughs) meats. And it it goes from being like a a half inch thick rice cake to being like a six inch tall, like mound of (laughs) melted cheese and, you know, deli meats and whatever seasonings. And then he pulls it, he like pulls it out of the microwave and he goes like, Mm, only, only 35, 35 calories. calories. <laughs> that's hilarious. And I think that's a, like, just to me, that visual is like the representation. Probably not everything he added to his rice cake was uh, a problem at, like a thing that we want to limit. Do you know what I mean? Like he was probably right. adding things that were just nutrient dense and just fine good foods to add. Um, but it's kind of, it's that, it's sort of thinking about the proportion, right? So when you start adding so many things that what you're eating is what you added and not the base thing, that's right. where, that, that's where that we get into shift. trouble. Um, so it's really like no one food is going to make or break your diet. Um, and that sort of refers to even the refined things that we might add, right? The the sugar and cream I might add to our coffee. That's not going to make or break your diet. That's not going to make or break your health. Um, but it's rather the relative proportions of those different things in our overall diet, whether or not the overall diet is a diet that will support long-term health or not, right? One that will dial up the risk versus dial down the risk. And I think it's really important in the context of diet culture teaching us that we have to eat that rice cake plain, right? That we have to eat eat vegetables plain. We have to be like- Take our coffee black. Right. Right. Yeah. In order for like, that we're not allowed to enjoy food. If we're enjoying food, we're doing it wrong, right? Or that we're, we're, it doesn't count. That's kind of like what diet culture has taught us. And I think that's a really horrible message because we are, we are, uh, we are creatures of like pleasure seeking creatures, right? Like right. food is a major source of tasty, pleasant feelings, joy. And to deny us the joy of food is to deny a basic human experience. I, th- I think a basic human right. And so um, so I think it's really important in this like bigger conversation of like you have permission to make vegetables and to prepare them in a way that tastes good to you. You get to make the Sichuan green beans with roasted garlic if that's the way you like them. Um, if you like them plain, eat them plain. Like, But you get to make them in a way that tastes good to you. And that doesn't negate the benefits of those green beans. We just want to be cognizant that we're still eating a green bean dish and not a, I don't know what you would add onto green beans uh, that would make it not a green bean dish anymore, but uh, cheese with Christmas green is, beans. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, with a little, like you want, you want the dish to be a green bean dish, not the green beans being the like sprinkled condiment on top of that. Makes yeah. sense. I really love how you pointed out how much sugar and salt and fat we should all like kind of keep our eye on. Is there a tool or resource where we can learn about like that and figure out like what the rest of our like plates or meals should look like? Do you have something like that we can use? So all of those uh, topics, like the science behind those, those ranges are all covered in my book, Nutribor. Um, and there's a really cool little guide in chapter four called the Nutrifor Meal Map. But if you don't want to get my book for, I don't know why you don't want it because it's such a good book. But if you wanted, say, a taste of what the Nutrifor Meal Map could look like, see what I did there? Taste, get it? <laughs> if you wanted to see that without the book, um, you can actually sign up for my newsletter. You can do that at Nutrifor.com slash join. And I send you like five free Nutrifor guides, one of which is the Nutrifor meal map, which is just a like way to balance a plate so that you're not overdoing salt or sugar or fat, but that you're crafting sort of a, a, a nutrient dense balanced meal. Not that all of our meals need to look like that, but if the majority of them do, it makes it really easy to be eating an overall healthy diet and have the right relative proportions of all of those different ingredients. That's so great. Thank you so much, Dr. Sarah. Thank you.